introduce Dr. Stephen Galen. Uh, Stephen received his BS from the University of Illinois in 2005. He received his master's degree from Iowa State in 2010, and then he finished his PhD in 2017. Do, do the math. <laughs> currently, uh, he is the research and field crops director at Practical Farmers of Iowa, a farmer-led nonprofit organization based in Ames that specializes in equipping farmers to build resilient farms and communities. Since 2013, Stefan has led the uh, Cooperators Program, PFI's vehicle, for conducting on-farm research and demonstration on the issues and concerns deemed most important by their farming members. He also coordinates field days, conference sessions, and workshops for PFI's field crops program, all in the spirit of fostering farmer-to-farmer -farmer knowledge sharing. Please help me welcome Dr. Galen. <laughs> okay, thanks, Daniel. Let's have some fun. All right, this is how I'm going to start. I'm going to put this sentence up. I want you all to think about this throughout the rest of my talk. Chew on it, let it roll around. So all of us are in this room, I presume, because we have curiosities and things we wonder about that we're exploring, right? Most of us are researchers or budding researchers. It's what we do, right? We seek to find things out and create new knowledge. So I work with a number of creative and curious farmers every day that are constantly asking questions about a multitude of things. And at Practical Farmers of Iowa, my colleagues and I, we do our best to provide a framework and carry on a legacy of farmer-led investigation. So I'm here today as the mouthpiece for that work, right? These aren't necessarily my stories. These are the farmer's stories, the people that have come before me and the people who are doing the work today. And disclaimer, it is by no means a comprehensive account of everything that has been done, that we're doing, or that we're going to do. So what I hope you take away from today is that the principles that we learn inside these walls on this campus as agronomists, and more importantly, scientists, those tools are especially, be, especially valuable and powerful outside of this campus, outside of these walls, as tools for change and empowerment and improvement. And in the context of this talk, particularly on the Iowa landscape. So in order for me to convey that to you today, that hope, I'm going to share with you a little bit of the history of Practical Farmers of Iowa, how on-farm research and investigation became fundamental to the organization, and then how that has blossomed and evolved to this day. OK, so keep this in mind. We'll come back to it, I promise. All right, first the history part. OK, love this photo. Practical farmers began in the mid-80s, 1985, okay, by a group of farmers. It was a total bottom-up endeavor. They weren't too happy. They were unsatisfied with the way agriculture was going. It was in the midst of fence row to fence row, get big or get out. Commodity prices were in the cellar and rural communities were being hollowed out. So these farmers decided, we've got to do something about that. We don't like what's happening to our rural livelihoods and to the agricultural landscape. Okay, so they established two goals. One was, it's up to us. We're going to create some knowledge, some information, and share it with each other and get better by each other. Okay? so that we can do something about what we're seeing that we're not liking on the landscape. And number two, we're going to generate that knowledge, that information, by research. Now it's going to be blowing smoke. We're going to do our due diligence and do it right. OK, so an early target was their corn production. This is Iowa, after all. It was still big in the 80s. It's big now. It's always been big. All right, quick poll of the audience. How many of your work, how much of your work, or how many of you are studying nitrogen in some fashion? Okay, of course you are. This is the agronomy department. <laughs> All right, this is from Dr. Moore. He's not here today. I, I wish he was. This is how he starts that class. At least he started that class 526 when I took it. And I love this definition of an agronomist. 
And I think it obviously still holds true because most of you raised your hands. And if you didn't raise your hand, you're probably lying. Okay. So these farmers were curious about it too. So you could also consider farmers are the original scientists or agronomists. Okay. So naturally, by by virtue of that, they were they were they were curious about nitrogen and what they could do as well. Okay. So they decided. Let's focus on nitrogen. Also, one of the early members of the organization, when I've talked to him about this work, he said, well, at the time, nitrogen was really expensive. Fertilizer was really expensive in the late 80s. And it was something that we could easily adjust on the farm. Okay? We could do one rate, tweak a rate, do stuff like that, apply it at different times, things like that. Okay, so we've got our first research question. At least these farmers came up with, all right, I'm applying a certain amount of nitrogen to my corn. Is that right? Is that wrong? Should I do something else? The next, that was the easy part, right? Got a question. We can all have questions. Next was, how am I going to test this on the farm? OK, so sometimes a typical way to try things out, take a look-see or whatnot, cut a big field in half, right? We've got big equipment. We don't have a lot of time because we're trying to get this done. This is our commercial enterprise, after all. This isn't just research plots out at the Boone Farm. OK? Or, you know, maybe not, that's not the best way. We could leave a few check strips on the edge, or we could still chunk that large field into four corners, something like that. But they knew that's probably still not the best way to go. I mean, some of us took classes at Iowa State Agronomy, and maybe we should talk to some researchers, and that's what they did about, hey, we want to test some things on farm. We're not quite sure how the best way to do it. We've tried it a few different ways. What do you think? So one of the things the farmers learned and the, and the researchers helped them figure out was, I bet you got a field. I bet your field looks like this. I bet you've got slopes. I bet you've got dry areas. I bet you've got wet areas. I bet you've got places that produce really well and places that produce not so well. And if you cut that field in half, you're probably going to bias some things. Okay, these are all the kinds of things that we learn in statistics in the Dr. Morris class, but this was something of an education to some of the farmers and something that we still have to do with people who we work with today. And what you should really do is take what we do out at small plots at the Nashua farm, the agronomy farm, the uh, other research stations, and you should take a hint from experimental design and try that across your field. And, you know, good luck. Are you going to be able to pull that off? And the farmer said, OK, that's, that's great. That sounds like approach we want. We want a rigorous scientific approach. We'll do you better. We'll do six reps. And we'll randomize and replicate those two, tr those two treatments. And yes, yeah, some of us have different size equipment, planters, toolbars, combines. But we know we have to accommodate those by making the strips wide enough that we're not contaminating the harvest pass, or we're not harvesting across the strip, or we're not harvesting you know, the borders of both strips together. We know we got to go down the middle of each of those strips, dump that into a way wagon, and record that at the end of each strip, at the end of the year. OK, now we have a question, and we have a framework or an experimental design that has been ver vetted, verified by statisticians, researchers here at Iowa State. OK, so from this five-year period on this, exp on this particular project, point of emphasis, 23 farms got involved, eventually created 58 site years. And yeah, their rates differed. I put those up for a reason. It wasn't that they were trying to figure out what is the right nitrogen rate for all of us, or for all of Iowa, or for this corner of Iowa. It was for, this is my practice, this is my rotation, is this the right nitrogen rate for me? And likewise, the other people involved, is this the right nitrogen rate for me? Maybe I'm following hay sometimes, so I don't need as much nitrogen, but maybe I need a little. Maybe I'm doing continuous corn. Maybe I'm in a corn soy oat rotation. Each of these had a different situation that they were looking to investigate. The question was similar, but it was particular to their farms. So the rates will vary. So that makes us have to look on it on a case-by-case -case basis, right? every location is going to have to be analyzed separately. And it was. OK, now, what did these guys find? OK, across the bottom, I have all those site years, all 58 site years. 
any response that falls above the zero line is an advantage to the higher rate, the typical rate that the farmers were using, their normal rate. Any, rate, any response that falls below that shows that actually they got a benefit from applying less nitrogen or their, their, their treatment. Maybe I cut my nitrogen rate in half or by two thirds. Okay, so what did they find? All right, so in some instances, their normal rate was better than when they cut it in half or cut it a little bit, and significantly. The instances actually saw yield decline. decline. Okay, that one side dressing, burn the roots, should probably ignore that one, but I wanted to include it anyway. So two instances of actual, the high rate resulted in less corn yield statistically. Okay, the kicker, right? The overwhelming majority of the sites found that cutting the nitrogen rate did not affect their corn yields. How do you think they responded to that? What does that mean? That means I'm spending too much money to get the same amount of yield. And if I can expect, I, Emphasis on my cost here from Tom's quote, quote, I know for sure on my farm, or not totally for sure, but I've got an inkling that I was putting on too much nitrogen. And now I can cut my costs, raise the same amount of crop, and come out a little more ahead on my balance sheet. This was powerful. When I talked to the, the, these folks who were involved in it, they always talk about these trials. They talk about the nitrogen trials. So when I was a young scientist here being taught by Dr. Wiedenheft, I would bring some results to her and, I'd, and, and she'd just look at me and say, so what? What Dave is saying here was their major so what? Now we have a tool a valuable tool that we can use to inform our decisions and make informed decisions for change and improvement on our farms. And then they just went nuts with it. They started having people to the farms and sharing, look, this is what I did. This is the tool that I use. I used randomized replicated strips and I realized that I could do this. Treatment A was better than treatment B for me. I don't know if it will be for you, but here is how you can figure it out. Here's a simple design that I used. You can do it too if you're a farmer. They started telling more people about the tool. And then they didn't stop there. They didn't stop at nitrogen. They looked at, can I use manure for, for, fertil for fertility? Can I reduce or eliminate my herbicides? by using some mechanical cultivation, inter-row cultivation. And some of them found, well, geez, I've got animals, they're producing enough fertility for my crops, and I've been able to now, by tweaking my weed management, eliminate herbicides from my, from my operation. Why am I buying these expensive inputs and I'm going organic? Not all of them did that, but a good number of them did. And they didn't tell others to do it, they just said, here's how I did it. You could do it too, or you could use this as a tool to tweak your inputs and cut your costs. Okay, and so here's Tom again. I love this photo. He shared this a few years ago in an event. This is him amazed at how well he could control weeds in his corn without herbicides. And he couldn't have done that but for learning the on-farm research tool that trained him and taught him and forced him to make critical decisions and observations about his farm. Okay, so fast forward in today. Who are practical farmers today? Well, we are a diverse mix. We're a big tent of ages, genders, operations, sizes, and enterprises. We have over 3,000 members, most of which are farmers. And we are entirely farmer-led and directed. Okay, so what does that mean? They tell us, my colleagues and I at Practical Farmers in the office, what we're supposed to do, the kinds of things that we're supposed to work on, the kinds of things that they want to see out on the Iowa landscape. So they put forward for us a shared vision. 
resilient farms on the landscape, vibrant communities for people to enjoy, to gather, share information, share knowledge, and a vision of healthy soil, clean water. Not too different from those goals that I talked about just before. Okay? So not much of that has totally changed. Those are still the major goals of drivers of practical farmers of Iowa. And the environmental ecological impacts of agriculture are still squarely on our minds and on the farmers' minds. They see this in their neighborhoods just as we do, driving across the landscape. So now this is sticking in people's minds and they don't like it. We don't like we still don't like seeing these kinds of things on the landscape, what agricultural practices at large are doing. And so in more recent years, cover crops have entered the foray. In the past, it was fertility, tillage practices, rotations, things like that, which are still of interest to the farmers involved. But in the last three years, about 60% of the research our farmers have done has involved cover crops in some fashion. And cover crops were also looked at back in the original days, too. But what is old becomes new, becomes old, becomes new. Okay, so farmers nowadays, they're, they're paying attention to what some of the work that is done in this room or in, at USDA or other places that show the benefits of cover crops ecologically, environmentally. Right? That's irrefutable. Hold soil in place, hold nutrients in place. Farmers are hearing that. They're understanding the concept. But then they ask, well, OK, that's great at research trials in Minnesota or at Wisconsin or Iowa State. What does that mean for me? How does a cover crop work in my system? So you know where I'm going with this. Well, we know we have a tool that we can use. Let's put some strip trials out there. So with, together with Iowa Learning Farms, our friends at Iowa Learning Farms, coordinated a number of sites, 12 sites across the state beginning in fall 2008. And within these farmers' corn and soybean systems, let's establish treatment strips that run the length of the field, are wide enough for at least one combine pass, and let's keep those strips in place in your corn soy rotation for the remainder of 10 years. Again, it's for you and your farm. I'm not going to tell you what corn variety to plant, what fertility practices to use, what tillage practices to use. All you got to do is put a cover crop in these strips every fall, terminate it in the spring, plant corn or beans, harvest them, and we'll look at the results. Okay, so about 10 years of data now. Across the bottom are the site years, this time chronologically, from the beginning of the trial to the end. And this is the corn side of the equation. Remember, each farm was corn soy rotation. Some years it was in corn, some years it was in soybeans, but the strips were always in the same place. So one farm that was corn in an odd year would be beans in an even year. There wouldn't be corn at every site every year. Just wanted to make that clear. All right, what happened? So some places sometimes saw a yield hit thanks to the cover crop. Okay, I'll point out, and I'll get back to this later, much of that happened and much of those real drastic Decreases happened early on in the experiment, early in the project. Okay. Some sites have recently seen a yield advantage to their corn from the cover crop. Just a few. And you know where I, you can tell where I'm going with this. Overwhelmingly, again, yield neutral, though. So that was pretty neat. Farmers were worried, well, I'm putting this cover crop out there. Isn't this going to be a weed? Isn't that going to rob me of yield potential? Maybe it could, but for the most part, not really. On your farms. Maybe research farms saw something different. Maybe other states see something different. But on your farms, guys, this is what you see. Okay, other side of the equation. Soybeans, a little bit of a different picture. Okay, now early on in the experiment, some guys saw yield improvements. And we're still seeing some yield improvements. And yeah, maybe a few, few hiccups, but most of the time yield neutral. OK, that's a long 10-year experiment. Boy, did we learn a lot. And what we learned, and what George learned, and others that 
Maybe beans have less of a steep learning curve with cover crops than corn. We know that early on when we are trying something new, like planting corn after a cover crop, we might mess up. We didn't all jump on bikes and learn how to ride without training wheels. Okay, so now I know how to set my planter and do, do things at the right time so that I don't run into those mistakes or these farmers could share those with other farmers. A lot of farmers, when they hear our far farmer researchers, they'll say, I like letting the PFI guys make the mistakes first, figure it out, and then tell me, and then I go do it, and I don't, and I don't screw up. Fine, great. Well, let us stick our neck out. We're the courageous ones. These guys will do it. I'm, I'm glad I got a laugh there from Rick. He knows. So, you know, this was huge, but okay, well, most of the time this was yield neutral, and that means added costs. But we, like, we liked the ecological and environmental benefits that we were witnessing on our farms, right? So what's interesting, what I put, I put George up here is he was one of the guys that actually fell out after five years because we couldn't force him to put in the check strips of no cover anymore. He said, I don't want to do that anymore. I, I know how to use cover crops. I know how to do this in my operation now. I've learned. It's been five years. I want the whole thing in cover crop. Okay, who, who am I to say or anybody else to say you can't plant a cover crop? So we let people fall out because that's the nature of on-farm research. All right, I did it for five years. It's good. You got some data. I got some data. I figured it out. I'm good to go. You're good to go. Great. And so they tell their, tell their neighbors and other farming companions about, look, I'm seeing really good things from cover crops. I figured out that I can manage them appropriately, that I'm not going to lose yield. Sometimes I'll see yield improvements. And actually, what I really like is that it holds the soil in place and the nutrients in place. And it really does that if I let the cover crop grow a little more in the spring, I noticed. So I get a little more benefit the more I let it go. And you know, one time I, you know, I, I was focusing on corn because I know that I need to stay ahead of the cover crop for corn because I know it can cause problems and I know I can see yield declines more likely than I'm going to see yield declines with soybeans. And one year I let things get ahead of me and I had to do this. I had to go out and plant beans because it was mid-May and it was time to plant beans, but I hadn't got that cover crop killed yet, but I just had to go do it. And you know, I felt less worrisome about it because of that older research that PFI and Learning Farms had done. And then I, I sprayed the cover crop the next day. And you know what? That bean field didn't turn out so bad. Now, I've got nothing to compare it to because I just did it slapdash and I put it in. But wait a minute, PFI has a tool for that. And so better follow it up with trials in the next few years. <laughs> so easy enough. Let's do replicated strip trial. Let's terminate that cover crop at a few different dates. Plant beans on the same day. See what happens. See if that bean field, those observations that you made the year before, or a couple of years before, about, well, oh, those beans didn't do so bad. Let's put them to the test, shall we? Okay, so a couple farms did it. Lo and behold, yields didn't turn out all that different, didn't turn out different at all statistically between the two termination dates. Same planting date, two different termination dates, two ridiculously different amounts of cover crops produced. So then the farmers tell me after they send me in their, their yield data, they say, hey, you know in those strips where I did this in May, where I planted green, as they call it, well, this is what they looked like in July and August. And at, what I should have told you and what I actually ended up doing was I didn't spray these strips with second pass of herbicide. And then the yields turned out to be the same. And I think we should put some pencil to paper and figure this out that I actually came ahead economically because of the cover crop. That was able to produce so much mulch, thatch, once it was killed and fell over, that seeding and applying the cover crop was actually less expensive than a post-emergence herbicide that they normally do or that they did in those other strips. 
So now they found the cash and cover crops, or the potential cash and cover crops, the short-term benefit. They love the long-term benefits to the soil, to the water, all those kinds of things. But they know that it costs money, and they know that for the most part, they were seeing yield maintenance, which is good, but it's not great. So now they gain confidence, right? And they're still realizing that valuable tool for improvement and change that they can make, they can tell others about, and they can be sure that they are actually witnessing what they're witnessing. And yeah, it's all about confidence to do it. And they were gaining confidence because of the trials and projects that they were doing. Not just for corn and soybeans only. So as I mentioned, we're a big tent organization. We've got fruit and vegetable farmers. In recent years, our, our vegetable farmers, they've been, they've been telling us, they've been telling PFI and, and other members that, you know what our customers really like? They really like lettuce. I don't know why, they just really like lettuce. And lettuce is generally grown in the cool times of the year, right? Once it gets hot, it's hard to grow lettuce, but people tell us they want lettuce. So you know what? PFI's got this tool for assessing things on farm, and we're learning about varieties lettuce varieties that can tolerate heat. So, does that mean anything to me? Can I try that on my farm, or should a number of us trial it and see how it shakes out? And they can do that same thing with lettuce varieties in their beds on their farms, replicate and randomize the varieties. And what they each found out was a different variety worked for them, for their operation, for their part of the state, for the way that they grew lettuce. And it changed the way, and it has changed the way, at least that's what they're telling us, that they are marketing their produce. They might even be finding institutional sales during the summer that they didn't have access to previously because they didn't have lettuce or they didn't have good enough lettuce at that time of year. Tool for change, tool for improvement. Okay, a big part of this program, this on-farm research program, is that the farmers are forced to convene and share the information, the challenges, and knowledge with each other. That's part of the gig. That's part of the deal. So they get together. They say, here's what I found, and here's what I did. Or here's what I did, here's what I found. Just as importantly, here's how I did it. And yeah, that is a plot map drawn on a notebook paper with a photo of it up on there. Whatever works for keeping track of your plots, your strips, and what treatments are in them. But important is that they tell each other to keep each other accountable. I did this as randomized replicated strips. Here's my plot map to, to prove it. Here's what I did. And yeah, hey, it's modern times 2019. You might have a hand one, what, drawn one, and you might have your onboard guidance system helping you out with it too. Any which way that works to keep track of them. After learning about what, when ha what happened for the previous year, then the real work begins. What should we do next? What kind of spin-off trials can we create? What kind of new trials can we create? How many reps can you do of that? Are you sure you can accommodate all those in your field? Coaching each other, checking each other, making sure that everyone can pull it off, making sure that it's meaningful to them, maybe to others. The wheels get and gears get turning. Then they go out and do it for that next year, and we come back again the following year. So does that sound familiar? It should because it's the scientific method made manifest. Right? Again, all those things that we're taught here as scientists, agronomists, whatever, about the scientific method, that is being used or can be used in those kinds of scenarios for improvement and change in informed decision making. Okay, so all in all, since the late 80s, farmers have been doing a lot of these trials, making informed decisions by using rigorous scientific design. Again, this was not meant to be a comprehensive um, presentation of all that work done. 1,300 trials, almost 1,400, couldn't talk about all of that. 
Okay, oftentimes we're asked, how do you do all that work? Who's funding that work? Okay, so this is again, not a comprehensive list, but this is just a snapshot of the different sources of funding that we access. And in last year, fiscal year 2018, we had about we had 50 grants, combination of state, federal, and foundation sources. So for those who are wondering, um, I'd have to, I have to thank some of my colleagues at Practical Farmers. This is the rest of the research team that I work with that helps farmers conduct these trials, make sure they're in line, stay in touch with them. Here's their observations. Here's their comments. Here's from them why they value the, the process and helps them then find venues for sharing it, whether it's in published reports, whether it's speaking engagements, whether it's hosting field days. So this is my teammates that help us all do it. Uh, I'd also be remiss if I didn't acknowledge these two giants shoulders that I stand on every day. I'm happy that Rick is actually in the audience today. So Rick and Sarah uh, stewarded this program before I came on. And you'll also be happy to learn that they were trained at Iowa State as well. So I'm proud to make that comment and I'm proud to follow, follow in the footsteps of these two. Okay, I told you I'd be coming back to this. Have you figured it out yet? Has you, have you been able to chew on it and get where I'm going with this? So it was coined by one of the founders of Practical Farmers. His name was Dick Thompson. He and his wife Sharon farmed in Boone. And Dick had a lot of different quotable lines, but this is the one that always sticks with me, probably on a daily basis, and that motivates me to do the work that I do. You can't buy the answers in a bag. And there he is with in one of his field days with all of the work that he had compiled, the notes, observations, and data displayed on a table, and, and proudly so. Okay, and so at a recent field day earlier this, this summer, I think a, a fellow member, another member, Tim Searn, kind of expands on Dick's notion quite well about doing things for yourself, because there's a lot of stuff out there and a lot of things that are, you're gonna be told are here, when it comes down to it, it's got to work for you and your farm. Okay, so I'll give the last word to Vic here as to the power of on-farm research for making informed choices as a tool or an agent for change and improvement. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank Daniel and Swatab for inviting me here today. This was a pleasure. I thank you all for being here today. And now what questions do you have for me? <laughs> Plenty of time too. Oh, I didn't just nail it. Okay, thanks Rick. Yeah, what's up? Yeah. Um, those nitrogen trials, um, you need to know that farmers didn't just randomly pick out some little rate. They used the technology that was being pushed at Iowa State at the time, the rate spring cell nitrate test. You go out there and you take a nitrate test, and you know if you're at the critical level or not, whether you've got enough nitrogen. And that's the test that they used to determine their side risk. And, uh, they saved 30 some pounds of nitrogen per acre on average, average of more than $6 an acre savings, uh, nitrogen prices at the time, and usually no significant difference in yield. Yeah. So um, Iowa State gets, or at least Fred Blackman gets credit for um, really helping farmers uh, learn how to do the late spring cell nitrate test. In personal opinion, it's still the best technology out there. You've got the time to take the sample. Uh, and, and I would say, as far as the experimental design, um, we get a little credit for that. Um, uh, we, Dick Thompson, who you mentioned, started out, and um, we divided one of the seals into like six pieces, and this is like 60. Or 
you know, and it, the results told us the difference between this side of the field and that side of the field. So we, we knew we had to do something different. And uh, we, we knew somehow that we had to get to smaller plot size, but it had to be farmable. Uh -huh. um, and I was at a farming systems conference in Nebraska talking to uh, uh, Chuck Francis out there at the University of Nebraska and telling him this problem. And Chuck said, compare it comparison. Okay, well, a comparison is a very simple example of a randomized complete block, and it's so simple that farmers can do their own math. So this yeah. really put the whole process uh, in the hands of the producer, mm -hmm. that, that they could get the yields, they could do a simple t-test, yep. and we had to do one square root, and, uh, and the six reps was, was partly because we realized know that they were still pretty big plots, but also yeah. I think we we thought we could do research just as good as anybody, and, and we, we weren't satisfied with the three reps that we might do on an experiment farm. So we decided to take it a little bit farther, but, yep. um, but when something goes wrong, we're glad to have six reps. So. Yeah, yeah. Anymore, some of them will do seven or six and say, just in case something goes wrong, and then, and then maybe it does go wrong, and it's just fine. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Rick, to summarize, a lot of those nitrogen rates that they trialed in the late 80s were informed by a test at the time that was being pioneered by Fred Blackmer here at Iowa State, the late spring soil nitrate test. So a lot of the PFI farmers helped refine that approach of taking a sample in early June, late May, and then deciding on well, how much you sh should side dress. So those lower rates were somewhat informed by that test that wasn't just picked out of a hat. Yeah, at the time, yeah, it was it was being refined at the time, and and th they were. Over time, yeah. they did get comfortable enough with yeah. what worked on their farm that yep. they, they're not taking the test now, most of them. But the test was important to getting them to the place where they had their comfortable. Absolutely. Yes, Sue. Well, also farmers at that time uh, were not used to having any power or any control. Over right. Yep. To get farmers to think a little more scientifically, to understand that this is a little more work for an enormous amount of results. Yeah. And now, I mean, these are wonderful to read these quotes over time, I figured out. But early on, in the bracket just suffered a lot because yeah. they started a little bit earlier than, than KFI started mm -hmm. trying to do research with farmers. They're very skeptical and, and not the easiest, what should I say, partners sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, so you make a good point, and I was just talking with Vic yesterday about this, because he said, you know, some just don't, won't, don't get the statistics and they, and they won't get it, and educating that is a really hard thing. It also, I will, I'll, I will state, and I, I, I failed to say this and I should have, it takes a certain kind of curious and creative and dedicated farmer to pull these off, right? So I think what both, Rick, both of you and Sue are alluding to is that this was, this was work. Right? You, you, you've got to follow through. You've got to, you can't just draw that map and say, I'm going to do it, and then April comes around or June comes around, and oh, crap, I'm, I throw it out, which happens, <laughs> I'll be honest. Rick, you know too, I'm sure. But those that really, really wanted to see what happened, they were committed, and they were going to see it through. And it takes a special type of person to want to do that. And they know that, and even people who, who don't want to do it, they know, I know I can't follow through with that. So I'll sit back, and I'll watch, I'll let PFI figure it out and screw up, and then I'll see what they learn, and I know I'll be able to apply some of that to me. Great. It's knowledge. Sharing. Mary. Hey, welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. So such a variable now that yeah. So within the farm. Sure. So do do farms 
will they repeat a trial or a flavor of that trial over a period? And so I'll, I'll, I guess I kind of gave it away. They'll, they'll kind of evolve the approach, right? Because they know, they learn something that year and say, well, yeah, maybe I'll do it a little differently. Right? These aren't our station trials where we're trying to do, we need it three years to be done the same way, right? That's great. I mean, that, I mean obviously that's what is the most perfect type of situation. But on a farm, we realize these guys and gals are thinking, okay, now maybe next year I'll do it a little differently or I'll do it better because I learned that first year I kind of screwed it up or oh, I let it get ahead of me. So it really is a tool for them to learn and get better. Now they know the power of I should do it again because it was a, the year, it was too good of a year. I know that won't work as well next year or I know next year it'll be better because it was a really bad year. So they understand that concept, but, and I can, and my colleagues and I, we can you know, move them or massage them in a way that says, you know, you should just kind of do this a couple years, but really it's up to them because if it doesn't become their project or their interest, psh, that dedication and commitment goes out the window, right? So they understand the power. And obviously those nitrogen trials show that and the cover crop trials show that too. Like, look, when you do it for multiple times, you can see patterns and trends and they get that. And certain ones are dedicated to doing that. Others are going to use it to, I'm going to use it to continually refine and improve and tweak things. Yes? So along those lines, how or do you provide, so there are statistical techniques to deal with that. They're called Bayesian techniques. Okay. Okay. Bayesians say, I'm going to adjust as I go. Okay. And there are, do you all provide them with these other tools? Because you're using what's called the frequentist approach, mm -hmm. which isn't very good in a world that's rapidly changing. I'm all ears as far as interpreting and analyzing this data differently. Okay, okay. so yes, we, we provide basic statistical interpretation with t tests, LSDs, things like that. Or, it, or there are, you know, you can use, like, as Rick kind of alluded to, if you've got an Excel function, you can run simple t-tests yourself on that, or you can use a stats book. But those kind of higher level, bigger things, I'm all ears to take those kinds of approach. I personally am not, I'm no statistician, I'm no perfect statistical interpreter or analyzer, but I'm all ears when it comes to the, the mind power in this room that is staring down on me. Oh, yeah, sure. On crop research. It's online. But, so I think we want to do it enhanced with DFI. That's, yes. That's what I was thinking. Yes, yeah, for, right before I started, Fernando and I were talking about, hey, when's, when are we going to talk more about that project that we we're going to look at, looking at all our research data over the years? And he said, yeah, I'm still thinking about it. We're going to do it. And he knows that I'm still thinking about it. So we're going to do it. Yes, Daniel. Um, are you guys looking? Yeah. It seems like they're more willing to change or try something. Yeah, so I'll answer that by, t t again, being the mouthpiece from these guys and gals who do it. You know, they see their neighbors not doing what they're doing, even though they show them the proof in the pudding. I mean, getting people to change that aren't going to change or don't want to change, it's a tough thing to do. I mean, the way that we kind of operate, they, they hear about us, they learn about us, they come to us, maybe they hear from a, a member that's a neighbor or they're at an event and that really piques their curiosity or they see, I never knew about these guys and gals, like, I want to get involved in that. So maybe we still reach those kinds of, and we're still trying to reach those kinds of people with the field days and events that our farmers host and other kinds of things that we find for our farmers to talk about, tell their stories that are informed by data and research, not just I did this once and it looked really good. I think y'all should do this, which is out there quite a bit. Sorting through all of that is a tough thing to do when, you know, this is your business and livelihood. But yeah, I mean, we're always, and our members are always looking to recruit and bring in more people to, as Rick put, drink, drink the Kool-Aid. But, you know, it's, they, they know because it's such a powerful tool for them to improve and they think that 
the whole state and the landscape can be improved just by taking that approach. Okay, I saw you first. Are you raising your hand again? Okay, yes. So, so you have 3,000 members about? A little over that, yeah. Do they all gather once a year to share information or how often do you meet? How do, how yeah, so decision making get done? how often do we meet decision making? So we do have a board of directors that steers a lot of our work. That represents our membership. Those are farmer members. We have an annual conference every year in Ames at the Sheeman building, you, right over here. You know, some of you come, I know that you come, but that's where we meet every year. And you know, we don't just talk about the research data, but it's farmers of all kinds come and share knowledge. Every year in December, the researchers meet by invite, because again, it's a special breed that it takes. It's not just getting together, hanging out, talking about cool farming stuff. We get down to brass tacks, we're gonna talk about research, how we're going to do it, what we should do for the next year. And then they host field days on their farms throughout the state where the public can come. Anybody can come to those events. The conference field days, those are open to the public. Anybody can come learn about what the farmers are doing. And we find other venues, conferences, workshops for them to speak at as well. And we, of course, we have an online presence. It's 2019, right? You were, you were next. Uh -huh. How would that have fared versus, say, switching to hydroponics instead of using it? My easiest answer to that is I don't know. I mean, so that would take a certain amount of investment of, that, of putting in that kind of operation, so they'd have to weigh that cost. And, okay, do I actually have? I mean, now maybe that might be a viable option when they realize, oh, there are opportunities for me to sell lettuce in the summertime. I should think of how I can do that better. Yeah, I could use these improved varieties maybe, but f quite frankly, you have to ask them. And to me, uh, I just don't know. They're the better ones to answer it. Good, cool question though. Glenn? So the yield neutral story about uh, cover crops is encouraging. Yeah. Um, nevertheless, I've read that there are various hurdles in the way for the average farmer uh, to use cover crops. Mm -hmm. uh, and the story that I read showed a farmer that saw the environmental and uh, other advantages and not a yield hit. So it was at least uh, yield neutral mm -hmm. for that farmer. But there was some kind of weird crop insurance thing that was in the way for him to continue. And so we stopped using cover crops. Where was this? Yeah, I, I wish I could tell you the details. Okay. But in a more general way, so, what other hurdles are there for oh, farmers? Oh, how much time you got? <laughs> uh, I mean, well, any more? So the crop insurance one now there's a you get a five dollar per acre discount on that. Okay. Um, that should help facilitate using cover. I mean, uh, I don't have time in the fall. I don't have time in the spring. Um, it, whether I'm too far north, which is a great common one, then you see people in Minnesota using them just fine. So, uh, whatever. Um, I mean, I mean, or what some of these guys will say. Okay, so now I get to quote from these guys and gals. It's what's between between their ears, um, is what's in their way. Dad, mom, grandpa are in their way. Um, yeah, it's different for everyone. And it, it, it frustrates a lot of these guys and gals who have taken the time to make it work and show, look, you can do it, but it takes a little work. You got to, you know, it's a different mindset to your operation. You might have to change when you apply fertilizer, not how much. Or, you know, you're going to be spraying maybe at different times because you've got a cover crop out there. Or you've got to prioritize planting that cover crop in the fall when, you know, you were just going to harvest and maybe apply some fertilizer or some manure in the fall and you were done. But you've got one extra thing that you might have to juggle. But if you get really good at it, you might be able to cut other costs. So you can do substitution of costs. But that's a little more advanced. So it takes time, right? Not jumping on a bike and learning how to ride that thing. Okay, Mary, you already asked one, so I'll go. So Tyrius. Like 
Yeah, I, I mean, this group is open to testing anything that they are curious about. So by all means, they get exposed to all kinds of things from people in this room, things they read about, oh, that sounds like a cool thing or a cool product or what, I want to try that out. Or people like you, Satiris, or other researchers say, hey, I've got an idea. Do you think any of your farmers would be interested in this? So you come and you present or I share your email with them and, and you tell them a little bit about it and they're like, yeah, I'll give that a shot. I'd like to see how that works on my farm. Or if I'm really curious, if a, if a researcher at Iowa State is curious about doing stuff with me, let's do it. And there's a number of you in this room that have done that. And I'm happy to facilitate that further. But they have to want to do it. Because otherwise, it's just not going to get done. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, um, I was soybean association, Absolutely. learning farm, Absolutely. do some meetings with the grasslands group. Mm -hmm. So you're, you really are branching to yeah. lots of different kinds of people, and it's not just agronomic now, it's horticultural, mm -hmm. it's forestry, yep. yeah. and policy. Yeah. Sure yeah. yeah, the breath keeps growing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's great to have partners that also address those kinds of things, and partners in other states as well, and countries for that matter, that have taken notice and want to replicate the model because they see the power of it. Daniel, do I have one more? Yeah, that last one. Okay, you're the last one. Better be good. I follow up with what Glenn said and these hurdles, and it's related to you can't buy solutions in the bag. Yep. Okay. So how much of a hurdle does the seed salesman, particularly in a world where there's only three you may have maybe many, many brands, but there's only three controlling interests. Uh -huh. um, how much of that is impacting? Yeah, so I think what you're getting at is the kinds of advice that farmers are receiving from their salespeople or agronomists. I should admit that that is a major hurdle. And, and that they're they, looking for one of three organizations. Well, there's that, but also do these young men and women understand cover crops, or are they of the ilk that says, well, don't do that, that's a waste of time and money, or you're just going to see a 30 yield hit. Major focus, and the farmers have recognized this too, we have to train some of these trainers so that they get on board. And some of them are really, really good. Some of them have, some of them have bought it, some of them have seen it, some of them have done it on their own farms because they come from farms that use cover crops or diverse rotations. They say, oh, okay, I can maybe apply that to my, to my work, the farmers that I work with. Others, not so much. So... Our farmers speak in front of those agronomists. I've, I've had the chance to do that with some of my other colleagues. Again, between the ears, it's tough, but it's the way it is. Do you have any more questions? I'm sure Stephen.